Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Boyd. Robert W. Boyd received the BS degree in physics from MIT and the PhD degree in physics from the University of California at Berkeley. His PhD thesis was supervised by Charles Towns and involved the use of nonlinear optical techniques in infrared detection for astronomy. He joined the faculty of University of Rochester in 1977 and in 2010 became Professor of Physics and Canada Excellence Research Chair in Quantum Nonlinear Optics at the University of Ottawa. His research involves studies of optical physics and of nonlinear optics. Professor Boyd has written two books, co-edited two anthologies, published over 500 research papers, about 46,000 citations, and a Google Edge Index of 107, and has been awarded 10 patents. He is a member of the Heidelberg Academy and the Royal Society of Canada. He is a past winner of the Towns Award, Shallow Prize, and the Humboldt Research Award. He is a fellow of IEEE, OSA, APS, and SPIKE. On behalf of all the members of REARS, I welcome you, sir, to this webinar. And I also welcome all the invited guests and participants to the webinar. A humble request to all the participants. All are requested to keep their microphones muted until the end of the webinar. After the talk, time will be given for interaction with the speaker. Also, all of you, please take care not to present your screen in between. Links for generating the e-certificate and providing feedback will be given at the end of the webinar. Now, I kindly request Professor Robert Boyd to begin the presentation. So uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning about uh, quantum imaging. I point out that the visuals of this talk will be posted uh, on my website. And of course, I'm very, very uh, pleased to have been invited to uh, to, to speak to uh, 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 to your uh, very robust uh, seminar series. So let's let me get started. Uh, so I want to talk to you about quantum imaging. And the first question is perhaps, what do we mean by quantum imaging? Well, the goal of quantum imaging is to produce better images using quantum methods. But then what do we mean by better? Well, uh, perhaps it's uh, we can form an image with a smaller number of photons. Perhaps we can achieve better spatial resolution or perhaps achieve a better signal to noise ratio than when using classical methods. Uh, there's another point of view that says that quantum imaging exploits the quantum properties of the transverse structure of light fields. So the, uh, uh, the, the field of quantum imaging is intimately linked to uh, recent studies on, uh, the, uh, on the transverse structure of light beams. So uh, and, uh, maybe this connection will develop as the talk goes on. So here's a very, very brief outline. Uh, we're going to do a quant uh, introduction to quantum imaging, uh, then a super resolution, uh, quantum non-local aberration correction, and a quantum uh, ghost imaging. Now, uh, a real serious question is, why am I interested in quantum imaging? We know that a uh, Nobel Prize was awarded a few years back for, uh, for nonlinear optical methods in, in imaging, and they work uh, extremely well. So why, why do we need quantum imaging? Uh, and I, I think that it's, it's a technical answer that uh, these beautiful results that we saw in the uh, Nobel lectures, uh, those were taken with samples that were stained. Uh, uh, which is a traditional method in, in microscopy. Uh, but uh, if you want to capture life, uh, if you want to do imaging in vivo, uh, where, the, uh, where the cells perhaps are, are, are still alive, you just cannot, uh, you cannot stain them. Uh, uh, so, I mean, that's one of the motivations for, for the uh, sort of work that we were doing. Now, uh, in, there are a couple of key resources that we have at our disposal when we want to do uh, quantum technologies of any sort, uh, such as quantum imaging. And one of these is parametric down conversion. And this is a source of entangled photons. And the setup is very simple. A laser beam illuminates a uh, nonlinear crystal. It's a second order nonlinear crystal. Uh, uh, occasionally, a laser photon will break up into a signal photon. 
and an idler photon. And we can picture this in terms of the energy level diagram shown here. Uh, pump photon disappears, signal and idler photons appear. Now, this signal and idler photons are said to be entangled. And uh, uh, in the most general case, they're entangled in many different degrees of freedom. Polarization, time and energy, uh, position and transverse momentum, angular position and angular and orbital angular momentum. Uh, why do we care about this? Well, uh, one is for fundamental tests of, uh, of quantum mechanics. Of course, the Nobel Prize in Physics of, of this year uh, was awarded to people who had uh, really made use of uh, these down conversion processes to uh, test out some of the fundamental properties of, uh, of quantum mechanics. But it's also useful for quantum technologies. For example, secure communications. Uh, some protocols for secure communication make use of entanglement. Let me describe very simply one example of what we mean by uh, entangled photons. And let's look at the energy level diagram at the right. It, let's assume we know the pump uh, frequency because that comes out of your laser. This can uh, break up into a signal photon and an idler photon and uh, make a very obvious statement if we measure the energy of the idler photon, we can immediately predict the energy of the signal photon. But the situation is a little richer than that. If instead we can measure the exact time at which the idler photon is emitted, and if we do that, we will find that the signal photon is emitted at exactly the same moment of time. However, if we measure the exact moment when the idler photon is emitted, we can no longer measure the, we no longer get a, uh, uh, a precise value for the energy of the signal photon. Uh, so something that we do with one photon seems to dictate what can happen to the other photon. And uh, this is known for a long, long time, and many people call this quantum weirdness. Now, uh, there's, another, uh, uh, there's another resource that we have in, in quantum technologies, and this is squeezed light generation. The setup is, is actually quite similar to the one for integral photon generation. Here we have a, uh, an optical cavity. Uh, in fact, you can just do it in free space. Uh, coherent light illuminates this cavity, and uh, it's a down conversion process, degenerate down conversion process. Light at frequency omega is generated by the cavity. So here. Uh, uh, a two omega photon is destroyed, and two photons, each at frequency omega, are, are created. Now, uh, this configuration can lead to what is known as squeeze light generation. And let me explain what we mean by squeeze light. Uh, let's represent the field leaving this cavity uh, in this complex plane, the real part of the field amplitude and the imaginary part of the field amplitude. Well, the vacuum state, well, it's not it's not exactly at zero. There are always quantum fluctuations, and uh, the uh, real and imaginary parts of E are not precisely defined. Uh, uh, in a vacuum state, we have this. But squeezed light, what would come out of this uh, um, uh, apparatus at the top, uh, we have an uncertainty ellipse, uh, which means that the fluctuations are greater than average along this diagonal, and they're smaller than uh, average along this diagonal. So if, if we perform a measurement, uh, say using homodyne detection, we can choose which uh, quadrature of the field to look at, and, and we find that we can uh, perform measurements with greater sensitivity than the traditional shot noise model would, uh, would have us believe. Now, uh, I noted that entanglement and squeezing share a common origin uh, and in fact you can turn one into the other so if you have two entangled beams of light and they meet at a beam splitter you find that the light leaving this beam splitter well, is, a, is a linear combination of these two and you get squeezed light coming out so you can turn squeezed light you can turn entangled light into squeezed light and then turn it back again if, if you so want so uh uh Let's take a look at some applications that are based on the use of, of quantum light. 
uh, one of them that has uh, achieved some uh, interest uh, is that of ghost imaging uh, or sometimes known as coincidence imaging. And the idea here is that uh, you, once again, you uh, start with a nonlinear crystal, excite with a laser beam, you generate two photons, and these are entangled with one another. One of these photons uh, uh, illuminates, interrogates uh, an object that you want to image, and this photon then falls onto a bucket detector. Uh, bucket meaning that there is no spatial resolution for this detector. The other photon hits a photodetector array, and if uh, and then we look in coincidence. We uh, we record the measurement for the photodetector array only if it is uh, accompanied by a detection event in the bucket detector. So th this uh, is called ghost imaging because we form an image with it using this photodetector array, but the photons that uh, illuminate the object uh, are not the ones that we use to pr perform the detection. So this has some applicability to uh, remote sensing. Uh, there have been debates in the literature as to whether this is a quantum mechanical process, and the answer is no. All you need is uh, e even classical correlations between these two photons are enough to, uh, uh, to perform this. Uh, uh, here are some uh, early demonstrations that, uh, that that this can be useful. Uh, uh, here's some demonstrations that uh, that, that this can be useful. Uh, here's another example. Uh, it's called single photon coincidence imaging, and it uh, uh, it sets out to answer the question: How much information can be carried by a single photon? So uh, here's the problem we have set up for ourselves. Uh, here we have uh, 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 one of four objects, A, B, C, D. We can put any one of those objects in this point here, and we want to ask, using a single photon, can we determine what that object is? So, so here's how we do it. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have a multi-exposure uh, hologram when the illumination of the hologram, uh, when the illumination that creates the hologram is of form A, the light is diffracted in this direction, when it's B into this direction, C into this direction, and D into, into this direction here. So, uh, so how might this work? Let's say you don't know what object is, is here. Somebody else puts it there. But when you get a click in detector B, you know that the object is B. If you get a click in C, you know it's C, et cetera. And at the bottom right here, uh, this shows uh, the coincidence count rate. So we see that uh, when, uh, when we have object A, most of the counts uh, occur in detector A. If we have uh, object B, most of them in detector B, etc., there's a small amount of crosstalk, but really only a very small amount of uh, of, of crosstalk. Uh, some purists, uh, and I would tend to agree with them, say that this is not really coincidence imaging; it's rather sorting, because we're asking which of these four objects uh, have you do we have here but one way or the other it's uh it's an intriguing use of uh, quantum technologies next uh just want to introduce another one of these quantum technologies it's uh, quantum lithography this was the concept of jonathan dowling who very sadly has passed away within the past year but uh uh, the I, Dowling's idea is that you can use entangled photons to form an interference pattern with detail finer than the Rayleigh limit. And in fact, if n is the number of entangled photons, one finds that the resolution is given by the wavelength of light uh, divided by 2n. I should say the limiting resolution yeah, is given by uh, the wavelength divided by twice n. And here is the laboratory setup. We once again start off with a laser beam, second order nonlinear crystal, parametric down conversion. 
Now, we make sure that these two photons are degenerate, uh, have the same energy. Uh, and uh, then the, we allow the two photons to combine at a beam splitter. And by the, uh, oh, the physical laws, uh, uh, describing a beam splitter in quantum light, we find that half of the time both photons leave in the upper arm Half the time, both photons leave in the lower arm, but you never get one photon here and one photon here. So now you uh, you allow this light then to fall onto a lithographic plate. This is a lithographic plate that works by two photon absorption. And the nature of the interference is not classical interference. It's that the probability amplitude of two photon absorption both photons coming from the lower arm interferes with two photon absorption, both from the upper arm. This gives you an interference pattern and the density of fringes is twice as large, is twice as great as in a uh, tr traditional uh, uh, interference pattern. So uh, this is the germ of how a technology could be built. If you can form uh, uh, sine waves, you, you, you can, uh, uh, form anything by a certain linear combination of these sine waves. And uh, here's some work, uh, let's see, I guess uh, both uh, from my laboratory and a paper jointly with John Dowling. Here's the classical interference pattern, and here's the quantum pattern, and you see that the, uh, the fringes are, are spaced uh, half as far apart. Now, uh, Super resolution based on entanglement. Uh, here was a, uh, here was an idea of Mach Tsang. and uh, Mach Tsang, uh, his contribution. I'm sorry. Let me go back one slide. Uh, his contribution was to note that to do this experiment is enormously difficult, and he's asking, is there some easier way that we could do it? Uh, so uh, he says, uh, if you if if you simply measure the centroid, the uh, the uh, the center uh, of the distribution of the uh, of the light uh, uh, f uh, falling onto your detection plane, you find that uh, that you can achieve the uh, the resolution that uh, Dowling had us uh, under had uh, had us believe. So uh, we did this experiment. It is just too difficult to explain right now, but we implemented Monkey Tsang's idea, and, and that's how we were able to find these results that I showed you on the uh, on the last slide. So, uh, well, here, just uh, as a uh, pushing things as far as they can go, we were able to show a 16-fold increase in the resolution of a phase measurement and what we did here was to simply let the light bounce uh, back and forth uh, within a complicated uh, trajectory. Uh, this led to an effective path length that was uh, larger th than, the, than the physical path length. And here shows the, uh, uh, how much we were able to shrink the uh, scale size of, of the uh, interfer interference pattern. Now, uh, I mentioned that there had been some uh, debate as to whether uh, as to whether uh, ghost imaging uh, is a purely quantum process or whether you can mimic its properties with a classical source. Uh, this was some work uh, from my own group. Uh, we. Uh, uh, we have a lens here, and this lens uh, can, uh, well, here's a test pattern, this lens can uh, make sure that the other detector is also in a conjugate image plane. Uh, and by changing the position of this lens, we can look either in the near field of the test pattern or in the far field of the test pattern. And uh, you see here that uh, if we have it set up like this, we get some uh, uh, we, we we get some fringes 
uh, in the far field, but we don't get uh, good uh, good fringes in the near field. Uh, so uh, a, uh, a sort of uncertainty relation. We can do it in the far field, we can do it in the near field, but we cannot do it with both if we are using a classical source. The, the key signature of a quantum source is that we could get sharp fringes both in the far field and in the near field. Now, if, if, if you feel that these fringes are not very well formed, I guess that's almost the whole point. We, we're working right at the limit of, of resolution where you can just barely make out the, uh, the fact that these fringes are present. Uh, so, okay, so here we showed what happened if we use a classical source. Now here we use the uh, uh, quantum entangled source that I had mentioned before. And now you get sharp fringes both in the near field and in the far field. Okay, so that was just a very quick uh, introduction to what we mean by quantum imaging. And let's move on to another topic now, that of quantum uh, super resolution. So super resolution, we've seen these pictures before. You have two point sources. Let's say that they are mutually incoherent. Uh, here they are clearly resolved. Here we're moving them closer together. Here we're at the limits of resolution, and here they are not resolved at all. Uh, so what does quantum mechanics have to say about our ability to achieve uh, super resolution? Well, uh, I guess it depends upon how we are going to perform the imaging. Of course, it is most natural to perform imaging in the coordinate space. That is to measure the intensity as a function of position. However, there are other ways you can do imaging. For example, you can take the image and decompose it into any complete orthogonal basis set, such as the Hermit-Gauss modes or the Glier-Gauss modes. Why would one want to do this? Well, there are advantages to describing images in terms of a mode decomposition. Often, a small number of parameters can be used to characterize an image. Uh, also, uh, techniques uh, exist for characterizing and manipulating the Lerner Gauss and Hermit Gauss modes. And uh, perhaps surprisingly, this sort of mode composition can be used for super resolution. So it's easier to do super resolution if you're dealing in a, in a modal basis. And uh, Manke Tsang uh, was the person who uh, came up with this idea. Uh, so, uh, uh, so complicated, but uh, here is the Fisher information. That tells you how much information you have about a scene. This is plotted against the distance between uh, two sources. Uh, Manke Tang using uh, methods from quantum information theory uh, points out that the normalized Fisher information need not drop to zero for a zero separation between the two points. Uh, this is the quantum optimal. Uh, this is direct imaging, where we just measure the intensity as a function of position. And you see that this does drop to zero at, uh, at, at zero separation. But theory says we should be able to do very, very much better uh, using uh, this quantum result, uh, including mode decomposition. So, uh, uh, well, so Manke Tseng uh, came up with this idea. Uh, it's called SPADE for spatial mode decomposition. And it's been confirmed, here's the prediction, it's been confirmed for transverse resolution uh, but by several groups. Uh, but we started asking, what about axial resolution? Uh, this is this can also be very important. So uh, here is our experimental results. Uh, uh, here is the uh, Fisher information. Here is again for direct imaging, and this is with a sorter based. So uh, Fisher information tells us what the maximum possible would be. It doesn't tell us exactly which protocol is going to to give us this maximum. 
but uh, uh, but you can see here that uh, some of these methods uh, are very very much better than uh, than the direct uh, uh, formation of, of an image. Upper right hand corner, I think this uh, illustrates the point. Direct imaging means that we just image a point on the object onto a point on the camera. Sorter based imaging is very different. Here we have a mode sorter. It, it takes this image, uh, separates it into various modes, and each mode falls onto a, a separate detector. And uh, don't want to go through the details now, but but this is the experimental setup we used, either for direct imaging or, or using uh, binary sorters. Uh, and uh, uh, here are the results, uh, direct imaging, sorter-based imaging. Uh, okay, uh, well, the measured separation as a function of separation, they both perform pretty well that way. But then let's ask, what about the standard deviation of the measurement? So uh, the uh, uh, let's compare at, at the limit of zero separation. We find that the standard deviation, normalized standard deviation here, is about six. I'm sorry, uh, but that the standard deviation here is, is is less than four. So there's about a factor of two improvement in the standard deviation through use of this modal uh, decomposition uh, of the object uh, that we want to measure. Uh, so, uh, Monke Tsang's method that, that we just, that I just described to you and showed you our laboratory results, uh, it can lead to a factor of two increased accuracy in determining the separation of two point sources. That is a, uh, is a very arbitrary uh, criterion that, that you have two point sources. The question is, can we use this method to increase the sharpness of more complicated images? Uh, natural images. Uh, so uh, we we took a look at this as a collaboration of a large number of people, which is not so surprising, uh, considering that this was a uh, uh, we had to introduce some new technology in, in order to do this, make this work. And uh, here are here's some of the things we've done. Uh, here is conventional confocal microscopy. Here we put a pinhole in front of the detector and the object is in the uh, conjugate plane of the pinhole. And uh, here is the sorter based uh, uh, microscopy. We remove the pinhole that one uses for conventional confocal microscopy and we replace it with a mode sorter. And uh, for this work, we're using a Zernike mode sorter the Zernike modes are the uh, um, uh, are the eigen modes uh, of an optical system with a uh, with a uh, uh, circular uh, entrance pupil. So uh, here are the first lowest uh, seven uh, Zernike modes. Here is their Fourier transform, telling you what the light would look like in uh, in a conjugate plane. And here are experimental results. So uh, here is the pattern that we started with. Here is, if you just do confocal microscopy, there is some semblance of, uh, of agreement. But now, how do you do the deconvolution? Well, you can use the uh, conventional method for deconvolution, or you can use the sorter-based method for uh, for deconvolution. Uh, this row, well, of course, the resolution gets better when you use more photons. So this column is for 10 to the 7th photons. This is for 10 to the 9th uh, photons. And what I'm asking you to believe is that this image here is, is uh, sharper than this image here. And in truth, it's really hard to look at them and see which one is sharper than the other. So we've devised a quantitative way of, of asking this. We calculate the overlap integral between this image and the original object. 
and we do the same thing for this image and, and the original object. And the results are given here. This is the peak signal to noise ratio. Uh, this is a measure of the goodness of a uh, 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 of an imaging method. And this is the illumination in terms of the total number of photons. And uh, the red up here is the sorter based deconvolution, and the blue is the conventional uh, uh, deconvolution. And you see that we pick up uh, maybe 50% uh, higher resolution using the uh, mode sorter method. Uh, 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 using the sorter-based deconvolution as compared to the conventional uh, deconvolution. Okay, and last topic uh, that we will have time for is that of quantum ghost imaging. So uh, we talked about this earlier, uh, ghost imaging. I just want to remind you about it, and now I want to take a closer look at some of its properties. So uh, in this example here, uh, we use parameter down conversion, but it uh, so it turns out that uh, any thermal light source contains enough correlations that uh, that one can do ghost imaging in this way. Uh, Gatti and her co-workers, including well, Lugiato, uh came up with this pre prediction in the year 2004. Uh, this is the intensity distribution of thermal light, and it looks like a speckle pattern. Uh, so, how? Uh, so we use pseudo thermal light in our studies. We create a speckle pattern with the same statistical properties as thermal light by scattering a laser beam off a rotating ground glass plate. Very very standard laboratory procedure, uh, and. Uh, well, uh, here's the setup. Uh, here's our laser beam. Uh, it passes through a ground glass plate, which is rotating. That produces a moving uh, a speckle pattern. Uh, here we have an object and a bucket detector. And uh, uh, the speckle pattern falls onto a CCD detector. We know what the speckle pattern is. Some of the light passes through the object and falls onto a uh, bucket detector. And then we, we look in correlation, just as we did, uh, 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 just as we did in the work I showed you earlier. So uh, here's maybe a way of understanding it. Uh, well, this is a contrast reversal. Where it's dark, that's supposed to be where you have a bright spot in the speckle. Uh, and let's say you have some object it's a very simple object. It's just this uh, rectangular opening. And you repeat the measurement many times. Each time you get a different speckle pattern. Each time you get a uh, different amount of light uh, coming through this opening. You take the amount coming through this opening and pixel by pixel you multiply uh, uh, what's in the uh, CCD arm by that number, and then you average it over a very large number of speckle patterns. And uh, on a good day, the movie plays. This is not a good day. Uh, what you'll see here is that as a function of time, as we add more and more of these realizations together, the image uh, suddenly appears uh, out of nowhere. Now. Uh, other type of ghost imaging, uh, this is one that was introduced by uh, Jeff Shapiro and later uh, uh, re uh, perfected by uh, the Israeli group of Jerome Silverberg. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in conventional ghost imaging, uh, you, you have some object here uh, and you uh, have a rotating ground glass diffuser, diffuser. In computational ghost imaging, uh, the question is why in the world do you need this diffuser to be here? Uh, and then you have to measure what the speckle pattern looks like. Uh, Jeff Shapiro's idea is uh, just 
use a, a computer uh, and a spatial light modulator, you can put a different random pattern of intensity onto the beam just by calculating a different speckle pattern each time. And here's some of their results showing that this uh, really does work. And uh, that's supposed to be a picture of a ghost. Now, uh, with ghost imaging, uh, I, I've worked in it, but I've always had this fear that this is not very useful. Uh, it's, a, it, it's not very useful. It's a fairly highly contrived situation. I think there is one example in which uh, two color ghost, uh, and that is two color ghost imaging, where this could really be useful. And how do I show this best? Sorry, let me go back to here. Nobody ever said that these two photons have to be of the same wavelength. Say one of them is at a short wavelength, one of them is at a longer wavelength. Uh, uh, you, you, you put the shorter wavelength photon here where you have good detector arrays. The longer wavelength photon interrogates the object uh, falls onto a bucket detector. Uh, uh, but let's say you don't have good, you don't have good photo detector arrays in, in the mid infrared. So uh, the fact that you have different wavelengths for each of these two photons could be very useful in, in, in practice. So let's go back to the situation here. Uh, you can imagine thermal ghost imaging with different colors. But what's actually easier to do is, uh, is using quantum ghost imaging. You just uh, arrange the phase matching condition of your down conversion crystal so that the two photons that are created are not of, of the same wavelength. Uh, and this uh, uh, the setup would look something like this. Then. Now, uh, we did this experiment. Uh, I did this uh, jointly with Miles Paget. Miles has been my <clears throat> co-worker in much of this work. So in this case here, what we did, we had a pump at 355 nanometers, and it produced a signal at 460 nanometers and an idler at 1550 nanometers. So the object is illuminated at 1550 nanometers, but the image is formed in coincidence at 460, and we have a ratio of uh, 3.4, which at the time was the largest uh, ratio of signal signal to idler photons. Uh, here is the setup. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I mean, here is the object. If the photon makes it through the object, it hits this detector. <clears throat> the, we call this the heralding detector. When a photon gets detected here, we turn, we gate the ICCD camera on for a brief uh, amount of time. Uh, hundreds of nanoseconds. Uh, we need an image preserving delay line. Uh, it actually takes a while for the ICCD camera to turn itself on after this trigger pulse hits it. So it's a, uh, uh, it's not the world's simplest experiment, but once we have this image preserving delay line set, we, we can keep it working. And here are, well, just here are some typical images just to show that this really does work. So uh, we are here looking through, um, we are looking through a piece of silicon. Uh, there is no way that 460 nanometer light would get through a, a piece of silicon but we're able to see the image because we're illuminating the object in this case with light at 15 50 nanometers last topic pretty much is quantum imaging by interaction free measurement uh, perhaps you've heard about this before the basis of interaction free measurement was due to Illitzer and Weidman and it was later applied to quantum imaging by Andy White, Paul Quiat, and their co-author, whom I have to admit I do not know. So uh, uh, here's the idea. First of all, let's start with a Mach Zender nephrometer. Initially, we don't put any block in this arm. We adjust the 
two arms so that we have constructive interference for this output port. We have destructive interference for this output port. Now, we illuminate it, and crucially, we illuminate the interferometer with a single photon. Now, uh, since it's a single photon, uh, single photon, well, at this beam splitter, it can go this way or this way. If it goes this way, and if it hits uh, the, this object, that will, that means that you, you can no longer get interference between the two arms of the interferometer. Because of that, you have light leaving this output port a quarter of the time, out this output port a quarter of the time, and 50% of the time, no light leaves the interferometer because it is uh, blocked by this object. Now, if you stop and think about this, it's a bit paradoxical. I mean, it, it's pretty clear that uh, when you uh, block one arm of an interferometer, the interference pattern is going, to, is going to disappear. On the other hand, this is supposed to be an opaque object. If a single photon hits an opaque object, the photon is absorbed, and there's no photon to be detected here. But we do detect something here. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a, uh, uh, a paradox, almost. I think the answer is that we shouldn't be thinking about uh, a photon being hitting this object. There's a probability amplitude for the photon to be in this arm. There's a probability amplitude for it to be in this arm. It's these probability amplitudes that, that interfere. But in the end, this is very, very strange. So uh, here is the, uh, uh, here, here is the imaging setup of, uh, of Andy White and, and co-workers. So, uh, I mean, the rest of the setup uh, is functionally the same as, as what was shown here. Uh, it, in the uh, object space, we have an object, and we can translate this object through the focal region of, of, of this beam of light here. And uh, when, uh, when we uh, block the light, then we get a signal in, uh, in D2. And here's some results. Uh, it, one is for a wire, and the, uh, uh, we've traced out the transverse uh, profile, the transmission of the wire. Uh, and the other was a uh, some sort of an opening in, in, in an aperture. Now, uh, needless to say, I was intrigued by this. So uh, my, my co-workers at the University of Ottawa, especially uh, Ebrahim Karimi uh, and, and uh, other members of, of our groups, uh, did the following. We said, let's repeat the uh, interaction-free measurement version of the experiment, but let's let two spatially entangled photons uh, 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 be created. One of the photons goes through this uh, interferometer. The other photon falls onto a photodetector array. So uh, when the detector D2 clicks, it means that the photon was certainly in this upper arm of, of the interferometer. The question then is, we've, we've localized the position of this photon. Do we localize the position of the other photon? Well, uh, presumably we do, but, uh, but it's not so clear uh, because this is an interaction-free measurement. So, so all of our intuition about, uh, uh, about how measurements work becomes a little bit uh, muddied when we look at this uh, situation here. So we, we did the experiment. This is the interaction-free ghost image of a straight wire. So uh, here in coincidence, uh, uh, the bright bar here is, is the image of the wire. Uh, if we look not in coincidence, but just measure what comes out, we, we, there is no trace of the wire but in coincidence counts, we do see the wire. Um, what are the conclusions? Well, the interaction-free ghost image is about five times narrower 
than the full spot size on the ICCD. And here is the full spot size. Here is the width of the image. So this result shows that interaction-free measurements lead to wave function collapse, just as would be the case for, uh, for standard measurements. Now, a uh, question we can ask, is interaction-free imaging useful? Well, uh, interaction-free imaging allows us to see what something looks like in the dark. So uh, when we get this image, we know that the photon did not hit the object. If the object is very easily damaged by intense laser light, we, we don't have to worry about that problem. Uh, this could be very useful for biophysics. For example, what does the retina look like when light does not hit it? Uh, th well, th this is some work in progress. Uh, and I think uh, it's uh, joint with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, it's biology oriented. Uh, biological materials provide phase structure but very little amplitude structure. So we, we need to build a, uh, a phase contrast microscope, but, but one that uh, use uh, quantum methods to increase the resolution. Uh, this is how we did it, and this is not the right moment to try to uh, trace beams of light through this entire apparatus. But here are the results down here. We have a series of uh, bar charts, uh, uh, resolution charts, and we can put these bars closer and closer together. Classically, only the widest separation is readily resolved, but uh, when we use this uh, quantum technique, uh, I should say, we, uh, the quantum technique in theory gives us a factor of two resolution, uh, basically because the uh, photon goes twice uh, th uh, through the object that we want to image. So here, the quantum measurement, uh, we can really resolve it all the way down to this point here. This is just a simulation uh, showing that uh, we think we understand what it is that we are doing. So, uh, so if my time is up, uh, that's it. Uh, uh, these pictures are a bit out of date, but I think it, uh, it, it shows the uh, it captures the essence. Uh, here is my group in Ottawa. Here is my group in Rochester. Ottawa group is twice as large. Uh, but when I took my position in Ottawa, I made special arrangements with both universities that I could keep my uh, my laboratory in, in Rochester as long as I could keep the laboratory being productive. And so far, I have done that. And uh, Okay, I thank you all for your attention, and I guess there's time for questions, I hope.